This moment has become a mythical one in Israel. The beginning of the Six-Day War. It's said an Israeli soldier scrawled a message on his country's first ever nuclear bomb. Never again. It's a show of strength. London, the summer of 1986. An informant offers the Sunday Times photos and other proof that Israel possesses a nuclear bomb. The paper's chief investigative reporter, Peter Hunnam, himself a physicist, travels to Australia and meets with the mysterious informant, Mordechai Vanunu. It turned out that he'd been a technician uh, working on the production of plutonium, which is quite a complex process, that this had been carried out uh, uh, in a, a building that was underground uh, and which could be disguised so that uh, if anyone visited the place, uh, you wouldn't know it was there. Underground nuclear facilities? For Peter Hunnam, that sounds far-fetched, but after doing some research, he's convinced Mordechai Vanunu is telling the truth. The final reason why we published the story uh, and, and, uh, was that we heard from Israel that uh, Shimon Peres had called together all the editors of the papers and said that the Sunday Times was about to publish something serious and, and, uh, and they shouldn't publish it. The story is a sensation worldwide. Vanunu reveals Israel has a fully-fledged nuclear weapons program, and it's around that time he meets a woman. He said to me he'd met this woman, and I, I was very suspicious. He said she was American, and that she um, uh, was a tourist, and that there was absolutely no problem. She was not going to cause him any harm. But I said, look, how do you know she isn't a, a, an agent for Mossad? I literally said that. Oh, no, I'm sure she isn't. I said, well, you've got to be very careful. A short time later, Venunu disappears without a trace. After a few weeks, Israel reveals that he's been imprisoned. But how did Israel get hold of him? Venunu was returning to prison from appearing in Jerusalem District Court. And they used to take him back and forth in a, in a van, uh, which, believe it or not, uh, had open windows. And uh, th as he was coming out, uh, he suddenly held his hand up to the window of the van, and on it he had written, I, Mordecai Venunu, was hijacked in Rome. But what was Venunu doing in Rome? Peter Hunnam follows his trail. It leads him to a woman who calls herself Cindy. Is she the American tourist? We then embarked on a, on a big investigation into uh, finding out more about Cindy, uh, and we discovered who he'd been sitting with on the flight. We had a name, Cindy Hannin, uh, and um, I started looking around the world. Hunnam finds the woman in Israel, an American-Israeli dual citizen. Her real name is Cheryl Bentoff, and she's the wife of a secret agent. I found out her address in, in, uh, in Israel and went and knocked on her door one day. And uh, it was an extraordinary confrontation. She rather reluctantly let me in. I said I was from the Sunday Times and I was going to write a story identifying her as the Mossad agent who had helped to kidnap him. And she, uh, after a while, listened to some of the things I was saying. And I said, but you haven't denied that you're the woman who, who kidnapped him. And she suddenly got up, screamed and shouted, I deny it, I deny everything, and ran and locked herself in her bedroom. Hunnam tries to piece together what happened. It was a honey trap. Cheryl Bentov lured him to a supposed love nest in Rome and then drugged him. There, Mossad abducted him. Venunu goes on trial. I tried to explain to the court that uh, he did it for ideological reasons, that he wasn't out to make money out of it, which was patently obvious as he hadn't received any. And uh, he um, was nevertheless not only found guilty of espionage, he was found guilty of uh, 
treason. And um, at that point, it was even possible that he could have been executed. But he was given 18, 18 years in jail. Vanunu has violated a taboo of the state of Israel. No one there is allowed to speak of the country's nuclear weapons, which do not officially exist. Israel does not want to submit to inspections. But it hopes the rest of the world will talk about the Israeli nuclear arsenal so it can still function as a deterrent. It's an ingenious strategy called Amimut, Hebrew for opacity. Nearly all Israelis go along with this bizarre set of rules. We have to be careful, you know, because I may get into trouble. We could start by saying that, before I get to anything else, by me saying that everything I know is from foreign sources. The subject of nuclear weapons in Israel is a very sensitive subject. It's a taboo subject. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol was following the Amimut strategy when US President Lyndon B. Johnson visited. They agreed on a formulation repeated to this day. Israel will not be the first country to introduce nuclear weapons to the Middle East. But what does introduce mean in this context? We see constant debate with the Americans. Uh, even in 1969, we still see uh, Yitzhak Rabin, then ambassador in Washington, arguing with State Department officials on what constitutes first introduction of nuclear weapons. Is it a test? Is it an advertisement that is a declaration? Or is it just the actual possession of the weapons? Johnson and Ben Gurion's follower, Ashkol, worked out a deal. And the deal was very simple. You, Israelis, don't tell, and we, Americans, don't know. Exactly, and Ashkol apparently said it a number of times. He said, I don't really understand what he introduced means himself, but there is a great beauty about it. It provides a certain elements of warning, a certain elements of semi-confirmation of closeness to the bomb, but at the same time, it keeps the introduction, whatever that means, as something that Israel would be uh, avoid. So there is element of double speech, and I think that part of the beauty was that it would allow Israel, once the United States was ready to accept that kind of formula, and ultimately the Israeli interpretation of that formula, I think the Israelis felt very, very comfortable. It's playing with words. I mean, it was dreamt up by Shimon Peres, this statement, and it's a very convenient thing for them to repeat, and they're repeating it even now. Um, um, it's, it's a non-statement. I mean, you know, Americans have uh, f f taken ships through the Suez Canal with nuclear weapons on them. Uh, technically, therefore, the Americans were the first <laughs> to bring nuclear weapons to the Middle East. I mean, it, it's a non-statement. High-ranking politicians, military officials, and other analysts today estimate Israel's nuclear weapons arsenal at between 100 and 400 state-of-the-art atomic warheads and launching systems including neutron bombs and mini hydrogen bombs, which could destroy underground bunkers, cruise missiles, which could wipe out entire cities, and even submarines that could transport the weapons all over the world. This arsenal is a reaction to the lessons of the Holocaust. During World War II, the Allies made other goals a priority over ending the genocide of Europe's Jews by the Nazi regime. The US did bomb the factories of the Auschwitz concentration camp in 1944, but only to halt the production of munitions there. The Allies did not heed the desperate calls by Jews around the world to help the victims of the Nazi race hate. During World War II, Europe's Jews were powerless against the merciless efforts to wipe them out. Those crimes were so unimaginable that even Zionists in Palestine initially reacted with disbelief. The Holocaust survivors who wanted to emigrate there were foreign to them. 
We were young Israelis who were able to defend ourselves. For us, the Holocaust was not just the greatest tragedy in all of Jewish history, which it was, certainly, but it was also a humiliation. Because of the Holocaust, we felt humiliated because we said, so many millions died in World War II, but most of them on the battlefield. And how did our brothers die? They were led like lambs to the slaughter. What was more serious for us was that we said they let themselves be led like lambs to the slaughter. The Zionists in Israel learned their lessons from the past. Never again would Jews be victims, never again would they be defenseless. They wanted to fight against the Arabs and colonial power, and for a country of their own, for life with dignity, as the Zionist visionary Theodor Herzl once imagined it. A further experience influenced the future of the Jewish state, the Manhattan Project, the construction of the world's first nuclear weapon in Los Alamos, New Mexico. The bombs that the United States dropped over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 had been developed in large part by Jewish scientists. With their help, the Americans had obtained this weapon and risen to become the undisputed superpower. Until a few years later, when the Soviet Union developed its own nuclear bomb. In 1948, the Zionists reached their goal, under the leadership of the first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion. The Jewish state became a reality. But it was by no means the end of a long fight. The violence continued. Israel was born out of war after the Arabs attacked. The young state clung to its avowal to never again be defenseless. The attitude was that Jews could only trust other Jews when it came to their own existence. From the day of its founding, Israel had a lot of enemies. It was clear to Ben-Gurion the Arabs would continue to fight against the new Jewish state. By his reckoning, the Arabs would only need to win once to destroy Israel, but Israel would have to win every war in order to survive. Ben-Gurion knew a nuclear bomb could turn the tide. In 1948, that goal was still out of reach, but the Prime Minister would pursue it by any means possible. Ben-Gurion has two allies who share his vision. Ernst David Bergman, a brilliant chemist who fled Nazi Germany, and Shimon Peres, who still influences Israeli politics to this day. They share the conviction that the bomb can be built. They want Israel's talented scientists to help ensure the existence of the state. In order to prevent another Holocaust, another Auschwitz, Israeli leaders felt that they must have the power to inflict another Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But Israel does not possess uranium. Intensive prospecting in the Negev desert has yielded close to nothing. In 1955, Israel finally has an opportunity to obtain uranium. A conference takes place in Geneva called Atoms for Peace. Eisenhower offers the participating nations nuclear technology if they promise not to use it to build nuclear weapons. At that time, civilian nuclear energy was seen as a hope for mankind. Because here, in fact, is the answer to a dream as old as man himself. A giant of limitless power at man's command. And where was it science found that giant? In the atom. Israel signed on to the Atom for Peace and bought a reactor, was purchasing a reactor from the United States, what's going to be the Nachal Sorek reactor, the small reactor. And already Israeli scientists from documents that we have, uh, started to explore the possibility of whether that kind of start can be used to create an option with military implications. 
but the research reactor at Nahal Sorek proves unsuitable for the production of plutonium. It's a bitter disappointment for the Israelis. The reactor built with the US aid will later be used to distract attention from the nuclear program's true goal. Israel starts looking for a different partner for developing nuclear weapons. It's a task for the country's best negotiator. Tout a commencé en 1952. It all began in Paris in 1952 with the arrival of a certain Shimon Peres, director of the Israeli Ministry of Defense and an employee of Ben Gurion. The goal of this cooperation was to gain as many weapons and as much know how from France as possible. De, de la France. Ben Gurion and his envoy know that France is also planning to develop a nuclear bomb. Shimon Peres hopes to gain access to this program. He's a welcome guest in Paris. Beaucoup d'hommes politiques donc ont été euh, séduits. Véritablement It must be said euh, that there were a lot of politicians who were seduced. Really seduced by Perez. Within two years, starting in 1954 or 1955, Shimon Perez became such an important person that his office was moved to the French Ministry of Defense. France and Israel share a deep mistrust of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, the new hope of the Arab world. In 1956, he nationalizes the Suez Canal, which was until then owned by Britain. The former colonial power refuses to accept the situation and along with France and Israel, wants a war. The plan is for Israel to attack. Then Britain and France will occupy the Suez Canal under the pretense of restoring peace. Nineteen fifty six saw the collusion between Israel, France and England. It was a conspiracy. But the Western powers plan fails. The United Nations, led by the US, preempt them by marching in as a regulatory force. Britain and France have lost. They are no longer involved in the power struggle in the Middle East. But it all pays off for the third ally, Israel. Britain supplies it with heavy water and uranium. The United Kingdom has had the atom bomb since 1952. And France helps Israel build a nuclear plant in the Negev Desert. It will help the country get weapons-grade plutonium. But the Israelis don't know they're being observed by U.S. spy planes. Near Beersheba, in an open area, in a desert area, all of a sudden we see them pouring a lot of concrete. I made the first briefing board and it, I labeled it uh, Beersheba, possible nuclear installation under construction. And my boss took it to, to brief Eisenhower and Eisenhower, after uh, Lundahl briefed him, he just pushed it aside. The reconnaissance photos surprise Brugioni. They show facilities similar to ones he's seen in aerial shots from France, where the US is also using spy planes. All of a sudden, uh, the uh, reactor at Demona, we renamed the place Demona, uh, it started taking on the same characteristics as the reactor at, at Mercure. So I made a, a two-fold briefing board. On one side, it, it, it opened up. On one side was French Mercure photographs, and on this side was the Israelis. And proof without a doubt that the French had some connection with the Demona installation. So Lundahl took it over to brief President Eisenhower, and President Eisenhower again pushed it aside. The CIA wants to find out more, so it sends agents disguised as tourists to the Negev Desert. 
This is some of the film taken by the CIA agents. For years, it remained undiscovered in a US archive. The agents wanted to find out what was being built with the huge amounts of concrete and who was sitting in the dozens of buses stopping in front of the facility each day. The American spies also report that the area around the facility is full of Mossad agents. Well, the Israelis got really touchy. In fact, they roughed up one of our attachés uh, when he tried to drive up, up to the area. And they were very sensitive too. They were tailing our, our cars. Film shot by the CIA agents shows that hundreds of French workers are employed at Demona. They're housed in newly built settlements nearby. It's clear to the American spies that there's a secret Franco-Israeli nuclear weapons program. French President Guy Mollet and his defense minister, Maurice Borges Monori, are pulling the strings. Gradually, there developed a secret circle, an exclusive club. Only those people, and not even members of the government, knew what was happening there. There were 20 or 30 members. Both countries were allied at the highest and most secret level. In other words, it was a kind of plot. And it's important to note that there was no official decision. We were supposedly a state of law, in which the parliament was theoretically very powerful. But parliament never approved these things. Israel's negotiator, Shimon Peres, is even able to obtain a contract for their help in building the bomb. He collaborates with the club and stretches the limit of what's legal. He's determined to reach his goal. Shimon Peres was able, in a way, to, to change the date or to write the date some hours or a day before just to make it valid, even though the, cabin, the, the, the government that signed the, the, the contract already essentially lost power in a vote of no confidence. This just shows how much Shimon Peres was determined to get it, to bring it home, uh, and on virtually all the means were kosher just to get that because the ultimately objective seems sacred in the eyes of Peres, in the eyes of Ben Gurions, and in the eyes of those very few who were involved in that. Israel has taken a huge step on its road to getting the bomb. The decisions in Israel and France are made outside of those countries' democratic institutions, although their effects are far-reaching for their citizens. Israel misleads the rest of the world about its true intentions. The Israelis were denying that they had anything in this area. In fact, uh, Shimon Peres said there was a textile mill under construction. It wasn't anything important. But when Charles de Gaulle becomes president of France in 1958, the country's foreign policy changes drastically. The new leader wants the nuclear bomb for France, not Israel. It takes a while before de Gaulle can implement his new policies, however. And for a long time, he is unaware of what's going on behind the scenes. General de Gaulle was not immediately informed of the nuclear activities. It took one and a half years until he'd been brought fully up to speed. Why wasn't he informed? Because the members of the club were in the political system, and they did all they could to reveal only a small part of what they knew. Ben-Gurion remains undeterred, despite the new political line from Paris. The Israelis still lack launching systems for their nuclear weapons, especially missiles. They know they have to hurry before things change too much in France. Then General de Gaulle decided to shut down the whole thing. But his orders were not carried out immediately on all levels. There were hurdles everywhere because the club was strongly represented in the army and the administration. 
and was involved in politics. In other words, even General de Gaulle couldn't enforce his orders. The club's methods were shrewd. Every time a decision was made, the club counteracted it with all its might. One example is the MD-620 missile. It was developed by the French defense contractor Dassault for Israel, even though, officially, there was no longer any cooperation. It later serves Israel as a launching system for nuclear weapons. But despite those supplies, Israel's relationship with France cools considerably. However, support soon comes from another source. Germany's Chancellor Konrad Adenauer is already supplying weapons to Israel. A document shows that he pledged 200 million marks to Israel annually for 10 years, starting in 1961. The negotiations were about what was referred to as a nuclear desalinization plant. No further details are known. The files about the secret corporation remain classified to this day. Intelligence about the secret in the Negev Desert is starting to leak out. That fuels speculation about Israel's possible nuclear weapons program. The political pressure is mounting. The focus of most attention is the nuclear reactor in Dimona, supposedly a textile mill. Can the Israelis produce weapons-grade plutonium there? In 1961, John F. Kennedy becomes President of the United States. Israel soon realizes there's resistance now from Washington too. Kennedy will try harder than any other US President to prevent Israel from getting the bomb. At times, it came also almost to confrontation. One time under President Kennedy, when he pressed very hard for American bilateral access to Dimona in order to ensure that Israel would not be able to reach nuclear weapons capability in order to halt proliferation in the eyes of Kennedy in the Middle East. Ultimately, Israel prevailed in that kind of, uh, that kind of confrontation, but the confrontation was a tough one. The public knew very, very little about it. Kennedy demands that Israel allow inspections in Demona. He wants to make sure they're not working on nuclear weapons. He threatens to withdraw all US economic aid unless Jerusalem agrees. Israel relents. At least, it appears so. À cause de la pression américaine, les Israéliens ont accepté une inspection de la commission The Americans put on enormous pressure. So Israel agreed to an inspection of the reactor by the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Theoretically, it was a research reactor, and not a reactor that could produce plutonium. So over several months, the Israelis built a control center that had nothing to do with reality. Behind this control center sat engineers and scientists who had programmed everything in case the Americans wanted to inspect the controls. They had made sure that data shown corresponded to those of a civilian reactor. In truth, Dimona serves only one purpose. It's a laboratory for plutonium and nuclear weapons. Publicly, the Israelis swear that it's a civilian project, but President Kennedy knows better. And Kennedy very much wanted to see the non-proliferation uh, treaty signed. So he put pretty brutal pressure on Ben-Gurion. And as part of that campaign, he also, for the first time, agreed to provide Israel with weapons. Because Ben-Gurion told Kennedy, uh, indirectly, of course, uh, not face to face. Look, if you want us to give up our nuclear program, we need other weapons to defend ourselves. So, uh, Kennedy agreed to provide Israel with Hawk anti aircraft missiles. And what did Israel do with those missiles? Put them around the reactor in uh, Dimona. John F. Kennedy is assassinated in 1963. Under his successor, Lyndon B. Johnson, America develops its friendship with Israel. From now on, the US will no longer look so closely at what's happening in Demona. 
The Arab states, led by NASA, as well as the Soviet Union, make more decisive calls for Israel to end its nuclear weapons program. They don't believe Israel's protestations. In 1965, an Arab summit was held, and it was formally decided that uh, the Arab world would not take this line down, but would go to preventive war against Israel. The Soviets develop a secret plan. They want to provoke Israel into making an attack. And the Soviet Union guarantees the Arab states that if Israel detonates a nuclear bomb, Moscow will retaliate with a nuclear strike. But the Soviets don't know just how close Israel is to reaching its goals. A few days later, it completes its first nuclear bomb. The most important parts of the facility are hidden underground, six stories below the surface of the desert. Secret doors lead to Israel's nuclear weapons center. Here, nuclear warheads are made from plutonium. And here is where Mordechai Vanunu will later work. The two uppermost floors are purely for show. The Soviet Union believes it can stop Dimona without provoking a reaction from the United States. A, as I mentioned, the situation in Vietnam was going against uh, the American administration. They did not want another involvement. B, perhaps uh, more importantly, if, as we found, one of the main Soviet aims uh, was uh, to stop the Israeli nuclear project before it could reach nuclear weapons. Uh, the Americans were not terribly happy about that project either. Uh, and see, uh, both the Soviets were interested in legitimacy uh, by getting the Israelis to attack first and thus being able to come to the aid of the victims of aggression, probably even rec so recognized by the United Nations. And the Americans certainly weren't interested in being identified with the aggressors. In 1967, the Soviets implement their plan. They have a secret weapon, the MiG Foxbat aircraft, with a top speed of 3,000 kilometers per hour. It's sent at high altitude to Dimona, Israel's most secret location. From there, interceptors and missiles are launched. Israel didn't have anything to counter uh, those flights. Another Foxbat takes off. For the first time, the highly armed Israelis are powerless. They're as unnerved as the Soviets hoped they would be. In anticipation of the expected Israeli attack, the Soviet Union readies further units, Tu-16 bombers. They obtained orders for bombing a certain object on Israeli territory. The ob objects were named uh, only by geographical uh, coordinates, but the main problem was that the object was uh, protected by uh, American Hawk missiles. The Tu-16s await their orders in the Caucasus. They're painted with the colors of the Arab League as camouflage. Their mission is to destroy Dimona. As the Soviet Union had hoped, Israel attacks the Arab Air Force. But no one, not even the Israelis themselves, could have predicted how successful they would be. The Arab League fighter jets are destroyed in a surprise attack on their airfields. The Soviet Tu-16 bombers are unable to even land on the ruined runways in Egypt. So the order to attack is never issued. On the very eve of the Six-Day War, there was already the possibility to display a weapon. One had been assembled. And yet, Helms, it was assembled with a crash effort on the very eve of the war. Um, and uh, Mr. Paris uh, says in his uh, memoirs that he suggested uh, a step that would deter the Arabs from opening a war. And he has not denied that it was uh, to demonstrate such a weapon. Um, thank goodness, of course, if that was indeed his suggestion, thank goodness it wasn't uh, adopted because, as I said, the Soviets, I'm not sure, would have made the difference between uh, uh, just the display and the use of a nuclear weapon, and there, was, uh, there were some missiles ready to be fired at Israel in such an eventuality. Amid this tense situation, the U.S. deploys the USS Liberty, 
a spy ship equipped with the very latest in intelligence gathering technology. On the third day of the war, the Pentagon orders all US naval ships to stay 120 miles away from the site of the fighting. But the Liberty fails to leave the area. Israeli aircraft circle above the ship. This photo was taken by a sailor on board the Liberty. The crew is certain that their friends, the Israelis, recognize them. But instead, unmarked aircraft fire at the Liberty and even drop napalm bombs repeatedly. A photo taken during the attack. The Liberty calls for backup. US jets are scrambled, but the White House calls them back. When the aircraft fly off, Israeli fast attack boats approach, firing five torpedoes. A photo of the battle. The Liberty is severely hit, but miraculously, the ship does not sink. When some of the lifeboats had been launched into the sea, the torpedoes came up and started shooting them uh, out of the sea. Now this is something in, in a war situation you are not supposed to do. Uh, but it, it uh, adds to the, uh, the evidence that this, the intention was that everybody should be killed on that ship and there should be nobody left to tell the story. To this day, Israel maintains the attack on the Liberty was a mistake. They say they thought the ship was an Egyptian horse freighter. The US Navy arrives to rescue the crew. 34 sailors were killed and 172 were injured. Even now, the survivors are convinced the Liberty was intentionally attacked. The real reason was that the Americans had wanted the ship sunk, uh, that the reason for unmarked planes and so on was, was that the world would assume that it was the Egyptians that had done it and that therefore the Americans would have an excuse to attack Egypt. Peter Hunnam has found evidence pointing to a joint American-Israeli plan. They show that shortly before the attack, three jets on board of the aircraft carrier USS America were loaded with nuclear bombs. When they thought the Liberty was uh, sinking, the Americans had planned uh, and set in motion an attack uh, by three uh, fighter bombers that took off from an aircraft carrier in, in, in the Mediterranean where the Sixth Fleet were based uh, on Cairo with thermonuclear weapons. Witnesses on board the aircraft carrier confirmed that the jets were loaded with armed nuclear munitions and they took off towards Cairo according to Hunnam's research. Israel denies that version of events. It says there was never a secret plan with the Americans. President Johnson, over the hotline, informed the Soviets. Um, one of our ships has been attacked, and we're taking measures to find out who did it and to take action if necessary against them. Whether they were nuclear or not, is again something that people have imputed, but I don't think has been actually documented. Uh, one would have to think, what would, whom would you drop those weapons on? Peter Hunnam thinks the intended targets would have been military bases in Cairo. The liberty was meant to be the pretext for defeating President Nasser in a war. There's absolutely no doubt from the research I did, talking to people who actually saw these planes with the nuclear weapons launched, um, that this actually uh, happened. Uh, about two or one and a half minutes before they were due to detonate these bombs, they got over Egyptian soil uh, when they were called back. At that point, the United States military forces were already on alert. Before the attack on the Liberty happened, all the uh, nuclear defense shield of the US, which consisted of uh, bombers uh, standing on the runways all over, all over the world, actually, ready to launch an attack on the Soviet Union, all that was in place, ready to launch an attack. The US military commanders had planned ahead, globally. Among the possible targets for American bombers in the event of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union and China, the People's Republic should not be left to profit from a U.S.-Soviet war. 
That is the inhuman logic of the Cold War. Did President Johnson really act so ruthlessly? The most important documents on the Liberty attack remain classified today. Until now, the superpowers had always been portrayed as helping to de-escalate conflicts in the Middle East, but apparently they were driving forces in the background. Israel and the United States have been close allies since 1967, despite or because of the Liberty. Two years later, Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir and US President Richard Nixon reach a clandestine agreement. Israel is now allowed to be a nuclear power. In 1973, on Yom Kippur, Syria and Egypt attack Israel. They advance quickly, and Israeli troops run low on ammunition. The future of the Jewish state is under serious threat. Apparently, the Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, was under panic, and he used those phrases about the end or the demise of the Third Temple, and in the first few days, he was uh, apparently in a state of panic. Israel faces a military defeat. Will it now use its nuclear arsenal? Will they follow through on the threat of the so-called Samson option? It stipulates that if Israel falls, its enemies will fall with it. And yet, despite all that, the legacy of Prime Minister Golda Meir was being rock solid and Israel did not violate its pledge not to be the first to introduce nuclear weapons. Israel did not even demonstrate its capability. I do believe, however, that nuclear weapons did play a role. The Americans want to ensure their role in this conflict and gather intelligence using what's then the fastest aircraft in the world, the SR-71. The Israelis know that the reconnaissance aircraft sensors can even detect nuclear warheads. So they arm their Jericho missiles with nuclear weapons and move them into position. They want the images taken by the spy planes to document Israel's silent threat. We see activity at their Jericho sites, and we see some activity at the bunkers where they probably have nuclear weapons. So now the concern is, my God, uh, we could be in a nuclear war here. The threatening gesture works. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger negotiates with the Soviet Union and the Arab states. With the help of the U.S., Israel will win this war, too. Israeli nuclear weapons play a role in the understanding the United States must supply Israel whatever she needs in conventional weaponry during the war. So they did play a role, but in tacit role. Tacit role in the sense of motivating the United States promptly to provide this airlift to Israel in order to Israel not to go nuclear. The Yom Kippur War is the first time Israel flexes its new military muscle. F-4 bombers with nuclear weapons wait for their orders to attack the Soviet Union. The Cold War has finally expanded to include the Middle East. Israel and the United States are now nuclear allies. During the Yom Kippur War, Israel kept its pledge to not be the first country to introduce nuclear weapons to the Middle East. At least, that's the view of things within Israel. But for the rest of the world, this pledge doesn't seem to apply. In 1979, the U.S. observes a nuclear explosion in the South Atlantic between Africa and Antarctica. Israel conducted a test with South African assistance and South African observers uh, off of the coast of South Africa, and that's what the Vila satellite detected. U.S. President Jimmy Carter is furious when his intelligence services inform him of the news. He's currently negotiating a peace deal between Egypt and Israel. Even before any of this had been analyzed and any guesses had been made by the U.S. intelligence agencies within the State Department and within the White House, there was an effort to sweep this under the rug and to make it go away. But the U.S. has known for years that South Africa wants the bomb too and they've known about the cooperation between Israel and the apartheid regime. From the earliest days of apartheid, 
uh, the people behind the nuclear power had a very close working relationship with people in Israel. And there seemed to be, you know, a two-way flow here. Uh, Israel had all sorts of expertise that it could provide. South Africa had the raw materials. It had abundant uranium deposits and so on to provide uh, uranium ore to Israel for processing. South Africa already has a simple nuclear bomb. Now they want missiles with hydrogen warheads. Israel is looking for buyers for its weapons and a new testing ground. It is undeterred by the politics of the racist South African government. A few days after the discussion of the possible Jericho deal, this is April 3rd, 1975, Shimon Peres and P.W. Bota sign a secrecy agreement committing the two countries to absolute secrecy on everything that they have discussed in these meetings and every transaction and contract that they have agreed to at this point. And one of the provisions in the secrecy agreement goes so far as to deny the very existence of that document. Israel's nuclear aid to South Africa violates the non-proliferation treaty. But Israel has never signed it. After all, it doesn't officially have the nuclear bomb. In 1991, an international coalition led by the United States fights against Iraq in the Gulf War. In retaliation for the attacks, Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein orders Scud missiles fired on Israel. Israeli civilians fear they may even attack them with poison gas. German Foreign Minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher experiences firsthand the Iraqi missile attacks and the reactions from the Israeli population. Just as he's visiting Israel, the Iraqi missile struck Tel Aviv and the surrounding area. And he sat in the shelter and experienced everything. We seriously reproached him. We alleged that the Europeans had given Saddam Hussein military and scientific aid, chemical aid for chemical weapons. And of course, we were against the French, against the Italians, against the Americans, against the British, against everyone who'd aided Saddam Hussein, but especially against the Germans. German Foreign Minister Genscher visited Israel and he had to hear lectures by our uh, Foreign Minister David Levy, uh, he was, about you know how wicked the Germans were that sold uh, Saddam Hussein technology or those rockets and so which was not true, but never mind. And, uh, and he kept in regular contact with the German Chancellor. We don't know what they discussed, but the result was he offered us submarines. Once again, Israel made the Gentiles feel guilty, of course, particularly the Germans, and once again it worked. Uh, and it's in many ways working to this day. Uh, it works. <laughs> I cannot feel, say personally, that I feel very comfortable with it. I mean, it is a humiliating position to be in. But then I'm not responsible for my country's security. In 1999, Germany provides Israel with three submarines worth one billion euros. Israel pays for half of one sub, the rest is a gift. All submarines are equipped with nuclear cruise missiles, a fact not discussed in Germany. The Germans always acted like they never understood it and never knew about it. And I'm speaking now of the highest levels in the government with whom I had regular contact. But I couldn't believe that. I think the Germans didn't want to know about it. So why won't the Germans speak about the Israeli nuclear weapons? One politician is prepared to give some information, one of the few who is. If we had asked about it, the worst thing would have been if the Israelis had given us an honest answer. Because if they had answered honestly and said, we will be using your delivery of conventionally powered submarines in the framework of our nuclear strategy, then the German governments would have had to justify themselves publicly. Later, two more submarines are delivered, 
they too can carry nuclear cruise missiles. Anyone who has to do with security policy and with the Israeli policy of deterrence would have to know that these submarines might be armed with nuclear weapons. I can't imagine any politician who'd spent even 15 minutes thinking about it who wouldn't come up with that option. And I think you can't then act surprised by it later on. That would suggest that I was naive in my decision-making and had not considered the consequences of my actions, or that I was starting to lie because I acted as if I didn't know something even though I had understood it. To this day, Israel maintains its policy of Anamut. Some say it's one of the world's mightiest nuclear powers and is not only targeting Arab countries. You don't want to deny it. You want everyone to speculate about it, and no one should know for sure. That is a deterrent. But we don't want to attack anyone with nuclear weapons. We don't want to wipe anyone out. Israel's nuclear weapons can reach any target around the world. It still refuses to allow inspections and bans its citizens from talking about the subject. Israel's nuclear weapons are a radioactive taboo, not subject to the rules of a democracy. I think that for the international community, as well as for Israel itself, time has come to find a way to address reality for what she is, for reality itself. And the reality is that Israel today is a nuclear weapon state, and it has to be acknowledged. To play games around it, I don't think it's right, neither for the world or for Israel.